G'day, Pastor Blake here. Thanks so much for watching this message today. I pray that this sermon and resource would help grow you in your relationship with Jesus, also in conjunction with a local church. If you have any questions about our church, you can head to our website, devonportcoc.com.au. Again, thanks for watching this message today, and I do hope that it blesses you in your love and devotion towards Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. It is great to be here on this long weekend as we continue preaching through the book of Philippians in our series titled Unfinished. In the Spanish city of Barcelona, there is a World Heritage listed church called La Sagrada Familia, means the Church of the Holy Family. Designed by the architect Anthony Gaudi, the cornerstone of the building was laid in 1882, 1882, and yet to this day, the building remains unfinished. Now, while he was alive, Gaudi oversaw everything about this ambitious project, from the overall construction right down to the minute details of which there are many. From 1883 until his death in 1926, building this church became his singular purpose. He actually moved into the church and lived there for a while so as not to waste time on anything else. And even though it's almost 100 years since Gaudi died, and he never saw the completion of his project, the legacy of his vision lives on in Barcelona as work continues on this incredible unfinished building. In fact, the unfinished status of this church has become part of the identity of Barcelona because it's been in progress for so long. Now, thankfully, our church's building project didn't linger for quite that long. <laughs> but in the year of our church's centenary, we need to remember that even after a hundred years, we haven't arrived. We're not done yet. And in spite of all the amazing things that God has done here, Unfinished means he's got more. And today our topic is unfinished purpose. Unfinished purpose. So think about your purpose in life just for a moment. Are you someone who is driven by purpose? Do you have a singular goal like Barcelona's architect, Gaudi? Or are you just getting up in the morning to get through the day so that you can do it all over again. Maybe you've got a fitness goal. I hear that gets some people out of bed really early. Or an upcoming holiday that you're working towards. I find that incredibly motivational. Maybe you're driven by success or being noticed or responsibilities. You got bills to pay. But if I rephrased it and said, spiritually speaking, what's your purpose in life? Well, that might put a bit of a different spin on your answer. And as we work through the first part of Philippians chapter 3, we'll find out what Paul thinks our purpose should be. And it's interesting to note that he doesn't separate his faith from the rest of his life. Philippians 3, verse 1. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. What an interesting thing to say. Rejoicing is a safeguard for you. 
I have to admit that I skimmed over verse 1 at first because uh, this passage actually has some classic Paul writing in it and I was really keen to get further down into the chapter. But actually, this sets the whole scene for us. In fact, it really sets the scene for the whole book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. Not in ourselves, not in our circumstances, not in our achievements, but rejoice in the Lord. Joy is a fruit or an outcome of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and it's a gift from God. True joy comes from him, and that's why we can have a perspective of joy even if we are suffering, as Pastor Blake spoke about a few weeks ago. To rejoice in the Lord is a choice that we can make which is not dependent on our circumstances. For example, Paul says in chapter 1 that he is rejoicing because the gospel is being preached, even though he is under house arrest and he's chained to a guard 24-7. He's not rejoicing in his situation. He's rejoicing in the Lord. Paul says that rejoicing, which is the act of being joyful, rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard for us. So what is rejoicing keeping us safe from? Paul believes that the opposite of rejoicing in the Lord is boasting in the flesh, meaning ourselves. An unhealthy overconfidence in our own achievements, a self-righteous approach to life where we think our opinion is morally more important than anyone else's. Rejoicing in the Lord safeguards us from self-righteousness. And Paul would know. So our first purpose today is rejoice in the Lord instead of focusing on yourself. You can see the difference in focus there. It's upward or inward. Now, we do need to have a little bit of inward focus. We do need to be self-aware. But whether it's boasting or complaining, if the aim is always look at me instead of thank you, Jesus... Christian, maybe have a think about changing your perspective. And Paul is about to launch into a personal reminder of the danger of looking for fulfillment and purpose in your own achievements and situation rather than rejoicing in the Lord. And this is who Paul used to be. Verse 4. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. I mean, he really thinks he was pretty good. But whatever were gains to me, all my credentials, all my status, my bank balance, my social media likes, my popularity, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Paul says, I used to think that was all really important. Like, I thought all my achievements made me more worthy than other people and more acceptable to God. My purpose was to be good enough for God's approval. And I was pretty confident I was getting there. Verse 7, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost 
all things. I consider them garbage. And that word there actually means excrement. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul's old purpose, to do important things that people would notice and that he thought made him more acceptable to God, to have religious status because of all of the laws that he kept. Paul's new purpose? Simply to know Christ. To understand that there is nothing he can achieve that makes him righteous or more acceptable in God's sight. Now, just a little side note to avoid any confusion. Following the Ten Commandments, doing good works is, as the phrase suggests, good like it's good, it's good to do good things. But you've just got to know that those things alone won't save you. Purpose number two, be found in Christ. Righteousness, a right standing with God, that comes from God on the basis of faith in Jesus. You can't earn it. It's a gift. Now, righteousness is not an overly common word, and I am no theologian, but we're just going to kind of flesh it out for a minute. In simple terms, righteousness is an essential and unchangeable characteristic of God, and it describes his perfect holiness. God can't be unrighteous. It's one of the things God can't do. He is the one who is morally right. But people, on the other hand, are not. You know, there are over a thousand chapters in the Bible, and it took two before people sinned. That happened in Genesis chapter 3. They just couldn't keep God's perfect moral standard. And even though God later gave the Ten Commandments, which got expanded to become what Paul here calls the law, no one could achieve God's perfect standard. Except Jesus. Except Jesus. So when we believe in the perfect saving work of Jesus on the cross, that his death and resurrection has the power to forgive us and redeem us and bring us into that right standing with God, then we receive the perfect righteousness of Christ. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus became sin so that we could become righteous. <laughs> and that should blow your mind. That is the exchange that Jesus made at the cross so that through faith we could have that right standing with God and be found in Christ. By all means, do good things. That is what the Bible asks us to do. Keep God's rules. Serve his church. Please, serve his church. But if you do those things hoping to make yourself more acceptable to God, then you nullify the power of Jesus on the cross. We do those things, as Paul continued to do, because we love God, not to prove ourselves worthy of love. 
Paul continues in verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Is that not one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible? That the Apostle Paul, some 30 years after his conversion, Paul, who wrote half, pretty much half of the New Testament of the Bible, Paul says, I'm not there yet. I am a work in progress. I'm unfinished and I have an unfinished purpose. Our goal of knowing Jesus won't be completely fulfilled until we get to heaven. So what should we do in the meantime? Press on. <laughs> Press on. And I don't mean keep doing the daily grind. Press on toward Jesus. Press on towards spiritual maturity. Now, we've all got valid reasons and amazing excuses for not prioritizing this life purpose of pressing on to know Jesus more. And I don't mean some people have got reasons and some people have got excuses. I think we all have both. So just think in your mind what your reason or excuse has been that you haven't been able to put Jesus first in your life. Think about what it is. And then add Paul's solution to the end of that sentence. Comma, but I press on. But I press on. I'm overwhelmed with worry about the future, but I press on trusting God. I'm so busy. I'm pulled in so many different directions. But I press on with my Bible reading plan because now more than ever, I need God's truth in my heart. And I've heard this a few times this year. This year has not started the way that I hoped. But I press on, prioritizing thankfulness because it reminds me of all God has done for me in the past. But is a powerful little word. Grammatically speaking, it's a conjunction, and it joins two different parts of a sentence together, and it can change the outcome. Instead of a full stop, comma, but... It's a powerful little attitude that reminds us that God's got more. Press on. Keep praying. Keep going. Keep seeking Jesus. He knows how long you've been praying for your family. He knows that life can be wearying. He knows... That temptation is knocking on your door. Press on toward Jesus. Let's continue and read verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, not getting stuck in my circumstances or my past or my own achievements. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you know where we first meet Paul in the Bible? He was known as Saul back then. 
But it's not on the road to Damascus where he has that amazing encounter with Jesus. No, we first meet Paul back in Acts chapter 7. When a bright young follower of Jesus called Stephen is murdered for preaching the gospel. The Jewish leaders were so angry with what he said that they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him to death. And Paul was there giving it his approval. And they thought that was the right thing to do. In fact, Paul was this young, up-and-coming, career-driven, highly motivated religious man. And his role was to guard the coats of the murderers so that they wouldn't be hindered in their act of rage. And then, inspired by the terrible success of the death of Stephen, Paul went on a personal mission to destroy the fledgling church. Breathing murderous threats, he dragged Christians out of their homes and off to prison. That is who Paul was until Jesus interrupted his life. It is one of the most miraculous testimonies in the Bible about how God can change people. And with a miraculous testimony, often comes a difficult past. But Paul says, I don't live back there. I can learn from it, but I don't live there. That's who I used to be. I'm not taking that baggage, that guilt with me into the future. Purpose number four, leave the past behind and strain toward eternity with Jesus. If you drive a car, you'll know that you can't drive forward if all you do is look in the rear vision mirror. That would be dangerous. I mean, sure, you need to check your mirrors, you need to see what's going on behind you and around you, but you can't stare only in the rear vision mirror or the reversing camera if you want to move forward. Paul says, it's time to let go. Don't chain yourself to your past. It's time to let go and move forward. Paul has forfeited his self-righteous religious status. He's had a complete turnaround. He's living out God's grace as a forgiven man. This guy used to get Christians imprisoned and killed. Verse 13, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining, that's active, not passive, straining toward what is in front, toward eternity with Jesus. That is Paul's unfinished purpose. What's your one thing? What's your one thing? One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What's your one thing? Is it like Paul living for Jesus every day until you reach eternity? Is that your life purpose? Is Jesus your one thing? Now, please don't be mistaken. Paul did not spend all his days and years just sitting around dreaming about heaven. <laughs> no, like us, this guy had things to do. He planted the church in Europe. 
He worked as a tent maker for a while to earn money to fund his trips. He traveled and he preached and he built friendships and he broke friendships. And when he couldn't go anywhere, he wrote letters. He trained people, he encouraged people, he corrected people, but he put God first in all of it. So what does it mean for my everyday life to have Jesus as my one thing, my most important purpose? How did Paul do it? Well, firstly, he rejoiced in the Lord. Jesus was Paul's source of joy, and no matter what his circumstances were, he rejoiced in the Lord. He changed his perspective from being about himself to being about Jesus. Secondly, he was found in Christ. Paul understood his identity was only complete by trusting in what Jesus had done for him on the cross. He pressed on toward Jesus. Paul had many challenges in his life, many challenges, but he kept his eye on the prize. There was always more to know about Jesus. There is always a next level to spiritual growth. He left the past behind him, straining toward eternity with Jesus. He's not the same man he used to be. He knew his purpose would remain unfinished until he got to eternity. Having Jesus as your one thing doesn't mean that your life is over. It's actually the passport to truly living Yeah, it might change a few things, but you can let those things go. It will remind you that this life is temporary, but the prize at the end will be worth it. When we see Jesus face to face and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, just like that church in Barcelona, our unfinished status is part of our spiritual identity and our gloriously unfinished purpose is to pursue Jesus all the way to eternity.